Welcome everybody to um, Boswell Book Company's virtual event series. We are very honored, as you see, to be hosting uh, Michael Benson, the author of Gangsters versus Nazis, How Jewish Mobsters Battled Nazis in Wartime America. Uh, the book has, uh, I guess it's blown up in the New York Post, but I am still quoting the wonderful review from Robert S. Davis in the New York Journal of Books, who wrote, uh, Benson tells his um, little known chapter of American Jewish history well and with passion. The prose is colorful and direct. And then I'm going to say just how colorful it was. Uh, Michael Benson is the author of more than 60 books, including the nonfiction crime titles, Betrayal in Blood, Killer Twins, and The Devil at Genesee Junction. He's the co-author, along with Frank DeMeo, of the acclaimed American Mafia history books, Carmine the Snake, Mafia Hitman, and Lord High Executioner. He regularly appears on ID Investigation Discovery Channel and is the recipient of the American Academy of American Poets Award. He told me he won that just last week. So congratulations <laughs> to you. I give you, Michael Benson, a virtual applause to you. <laughs> Thanks for joining us. Well, thank you, Daniel. Uh, and thanks everybody for coming in. Uh, I'm going to be talking about my new book. It is Gangsters versus Nazis, a story about Jewish gangsters of the Great Depression who busted up Hitler worshiping German American Bund meetings uh, and stifled a movement that was attempting to win the hearts and minds of Americans with their hate speech. Now, that said, it's a rather lighthearted book. Gangsters are the good guys, Nazis the bad guys, not much gray area. Um, and that was a conscious choice on my part, not just to sugarcoat the pill, although it does that, uh, but as to avoid uh, being read as an emotional counterpoint to the Holocaust, which nothing can be. Uh, this is a small compartment of history, largely but not entirely rendered moot by Pearl Harbor, but interesting as hell. Um, it's a book that takes place almost entirely in the chaotic zone between what is legal and what is just. Uh, and it is, first slide please. As our story takes place, America and the world had just endured almost a decade of the Great Depression uh, when it felt like no one had any money. And it's easy to form scapegoats under those circumstances, which is uh, exactly what the, uh, the Nazis did. They blamed the Jews for the depression. They said that uh, Jews were all communists and they had all the money and that's why no one else had any money, which must have come as quite a shock to the ragman whose uh, horse just dropped dead in the middle of a street in Newark, New Jersey. Um, but that's the, way, that's the way disinformation is. It takes uh, a group of people who are largely innocent and makes them look like they are the villains. Um, so the German American Bund began holding rallies and preaching despicable ways of solving the quote, Jewish problem, unquote. Mm. Important to note, this book takes place in 1938 and there's no such thing as hate speech laws at that, at that time. Um, so if the Nazis didn't say anything obscene or shout fire in a crowded room, they could get away with saying whatever they wanted. Next slide, please. Now, while on the other side of the Atlantic, you know, Nazi armies were marching across Europe with their sights on Great Britain, here in uh, America, Nazis were having parades right in city streets. This is a picture of East 86th Street in New York City. It's the main drag of Yorkville the German neighborhood. And look at this. This looks like uh, the Macy's Day Parade. Uh, you might see on Thanksgiving. Instead of balloons, they've got American flags and swastika flags side by side. This warms your heart. Uh, next slide, please. Now, it, you know, it really wasn't the number of Nazis in America. I guess there were somewhere between 50,000 and 100,000 Nazis in America in 1938. The thing that bothered Jewish leaders the most was the bold and brazen nature of their actions. I mean, here's a parade in a, in a camp, a, a youth camp uh, in New Jersey, where youngsters are, are being initiated into 
into the ways of the Nazi party to learn to worship Hitler and hate Jews. Uh, and you can see the people Sig Heiling there. And the, there's American flags, again, American flags mixed with, uh, with swastikas because uh, they were trying to put over that uh, the Nazis were uh, the new American way. They were going to make America great again by getting rid of the Jews. Next slide, please. Okay, the fellow there on the, the left in the front, that's Fritz Kuhn. He is the leader, the Führer of the German-American Bund. And here he is uh, giving the Sieg Heil to again, a combination of, of German flags and American flags and youthful, you know, youth uh, in, in their uniforms. They were called the brown shirts because they, they wore brown uniforms. And they tried to look as much like an army as possible. But when it came to fight, as it turned out, they, they weren't very good at it. Next slide, please. There he is. That's, that's Fritz Kuhn, close up. Now, he, uh, he changed the nature of the German-American organizations when he took over. Uh, before Kuhn, they pretty much interested in drinking beer and speaking German to one another and celebrating all things that had to do with the the fatherland uh kuhn takes over and all of a sudden there's a lot of uh a lot of hitler talk and hate talk going on uh obviously there's a uh, there's an agenda here that that's new next slide please and this is our hero judge nathan david perlman uh he uh he was a character. He uh, had been a former U.S. congressman who had been one of the fellows to vote to repeal prohibition. He never let his bartender forget it. And uh, he was, he'd been born in Europe, came over as a small child, went to NYU, went to NYU Law School, and uh, eventually became a, a New York judge after his stint in, in, uh, in, the, in the Congress. And uh, he was fed up with the Nazis. He, was, he attended an event in the Bowling Green area of, of Manhattan, southern tip of Manhattan, uh, in which uh, a patriotic ceremony was forced inside because the German-American Bund came marching by and chanting with their signs and stuff. And Perlman ducked into a bar and thought about it and brooded about it and snapped his fingers and decided that what these Nazis really needed was a good butt kicking. Next slide, please. So he makes a phone call to Meyer Lansky, the all time greatest, biggest Jewish gangster. Um, how he knows Meyer Lansky, a little bit of a fuzzy area. I don't think it had anything to do with the justice system. I suspect it had to do with Meyer Lansky being a bootlegger during the prohibition and Nathan Perlman being a drinker. Uh, but he calls Lansky and, and he says, you know, do, do you have any boys that might be willing to punch a Nazi? And Lansky says, uh, well, sure. But uh, with all due respect, Judge, we could do better than punch. After all, they were, they were known as Murder, Inc. Uh, and Judge Perlman said, no, 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 no. Now, first of all, the rabbi will, wouldn't approve of that. And if you start killing the Nazis, you're going to lose the moral high ground, and that'll be that. Just let them know that even a Nazi can have trouble in this world and that Jews can be tough and fight back. Lansky says, I got you covered. Next slide, please. So Lansky assigns the Jewish members of Murder, Inc. And, uh, to, to take on the Nazis. This is where uh, Murder, Inc. had their headquarters in the back room of Midnight Rose's candy store. They were sort of like firemen. They would sit back there and they would play cards and drink espresso and, and eat bagels and wait for the phone to ring. And they'd be sent out to whack a guy. But, and uh, Midnight Rose was a character herself. She, uh, she ran numbers out of her front window along with the penny candy. And she had women working upstairs. Next slide, please. So among the people who fought Nazis was, were this fellow, Abe Kid Twist Relis. 
Now, as his name suggests, his favorite way to kill involved wringing a poor, poor guy's neck. He was the son of an immigrant from Brownsville, Brooklyn, had 49 arrests on his records, on his record, and he ended up turning rat. That meant he squealed on, on his fellow mobsters and died in protective police custody. He uh, fell or was pushed from a six story window of a hotel overlooking uh, the Atlantic Ocean at Coney Island, which led to the uh, saying that this canary could sing, but he couldn't fly. Next slide, please. This is Charles Bug Workman. A bug, and when it comes to a gangster's nickname, always means crazy, like bug, bugs, bugsy, all the same thing. It means they're off their rocker. And uh, Workman was short, had curly hair, had 20 notches on his gun, but was very proud of the fact that every single one of them was a gangster. There had never been any collateral damage in any of his wax. He uh, carried out all of his hits accurately, which wasn't always the case. Sometimes these guys went out and killed the wrong guy. Um, now, two years after the Nazi battles, he was arrested during the winter of uh, 1940 in the Brighton Beach section of Brooklyn, right next door to Coney Island. And charged with the murder of Dutch Schultz in New Jersey, and he spent the rest of his life in prison, which is when he had his picture taken here. Next slide, please. Harry Strauss, aka Pep, aka Pittsburgh Phil. Last nickname's my favorite because his name wasn't Phil, and by all accounts, he had never been to Pittsburgh. But he only had one facial expression, and that was one of extreme impatience. He was big, strong, and ruthless. Um, a homicide artist with a variety of styles. Depending on his mood, he experimented with rope, knife, gun, ice pick, bare hands, disemboweling. Uh, he, he felt it a personal challenge and felt victorious and, and, and proud if he could make the coroner vomit. Next slide, please. Bugsy Goldstein is another, another wacko. He, uh, he, although it doesn't really look like it in this photo, he was the class clown. And he had a reputation for popping off one-liners at inappropriate moments. Uh, you need me like a hole in the head, right? And then he put a hole in the guy's head, that kind of thing. And he's, he's good with his fists and knew how to throw the old one too when he was confronted with an anti-Semite. Next slide, please. Mendy Weiss. Big man born in New York in 1906. He could handle himself in a bar fight. He killed with his hands. He would brutally overpower his victims. If you asked him what he did for a living, he'd say, I have two vocations. I am both a kidnapper and a choker. So he was a, a psycho among psychos and capable, capable of robbing a woman while holding a gun on her baby. But he never shot the baby. He died in the electric chair, sizzling in Sing Sing's legendary old Sparky. Next slide, please. Albert Tick Tock Tannenbaum happened to be in the hotel room when Kid Twist took the dive out the six story window. Might be a coincidence, I don't know. But he, uh, he moved with his family to New York's Lower East Side when he was three and then moved again to Brownsville where he did the bulk of his growing up. And he was different from the other guys in Murder Inc. in that he was not a street kid. His father ran a country club and he, he had uh, never committed any kind of crime of any sort until he was 25 when he decided he wanted to become a professional killer and took to it right away and became a trusted member of Murder, Inc. Next slide, please. Blue Jaw Magoon. Now, Blue Jaw got his nickname because he looked like he needed to shave about five minutes after he shaved. And he... Uh, he ended up being one of the victims of a, uh, his girlfriend, Evelyn Middleman. Now, Evelyn Middleman was a woman who was guaranteed to be very, very cooperative with any hood who spent money on her. And three times her boyfriend was killed while she was in the vicinity. So uh, yeah, you would think that after a while, guys would stop dating her, but they didn't. And eventually one day Magoon just disappears and nobody knew what happened to him until 2003, when his skeleton was found partially buried in the desert just outside Las Vegas. 
The next slide, please. So these guys took on the German American Bund in this building, Yorkville Casino. Uh, not a gambling house, casino just meant party house at that time. And <clears throat> the no killing rule came closest to being broken in the very first fight against the Nazis when Lansky and, uh, and Bugsy Goldstein threw a guy out the second story window. The guy landed on his feet and shattered one leg. But if he landed on his head, I think he probably would have died. Next slide, please. Yeah, after the Yorkville riot, a bunch of Nazis ended up in the emergency room. Mayor LaGuardia made it harder for the Nazis to meet in Manhattan, banned the uniforms, made it more complicated for them to, to get permits to do things. So what they did is they went across the Hudson River to, to Newark, New Jersey, where the war against them started anew when Judge Perlman called this man, Abner Longies Wilman, who was, again, this is a, a pattern, he was one of the five biggest bootleggers during Prohibition, was a zillionaire because he'd sold illegal booze, a uh, very popular guy, had once dated movie star Gene Harlow. And he said, sure, you know, we've, we've got plenty of guys in Newark who, uh, who would want to punch a Nazi. And some of them were gangsters. And some of them were, were boxers. And the line between those two groups was a little blurry in 1938 because boxing was run by gangsters. Next slide, please. So Zwillman wasn't the sort of guy to get his, his hands dirty. So he put this fellow, Nat Arno, who was then a, a recently retired boxer. This photo was taken a little later on, I think. Um, and Arno led a group of... of men called the the Minutemen after the, the Revolutionary War guys. Uh, and it was by far the biggest anti-Nazi army that we that we cover in the book. There were upwards of a thousand Minutemen. And it seemed like the entire Jewish uh, neighborhood, all of the men would roll up their sleeves and, and head out if they knew that the Nazis were having a meeting. Next slide, please. This is Abby Bain. He, uh, he was one of the best fighters of, of Newark to, uh, to, to, to fight the Nazis. He, was, he had once fought two-ton Tony Galento, lost badly. Uh, and Tony Galento, in, in turn, had once fought Joe Lewis and lost badly. But uh, when it came to, to fighting Nazis, Abby Bain was always dominant. Next slide, please. Putty Hankus, another, uh, another Newark fighter who joined the Minutemen. He, uh, as it says in my caption, I can't be funnier than that. He was a pro fighter, but he punched Nazis for free. Next slide, please. Now we move to Chicago. And this fellow is Herb Brin. He is neither a gangster nor a Nazi. He was a Jewish journalist who, because he could pass for Gentile, was assigned by the Anti-Defamation League, the Nay Brith, to infiltrate the German-American Bund. Because by this time, they're not having the big public rallies anymore because uh, there's always problems. And the, the meetings are going underground and, and secret. But Herb Brin infiltrates that group. And when he finds out when the next meeting's going to be, he gives the location and the time to, uh, to the gangsters and the fighters in Chicago who take care of it. Uh, next slide, please. Now, the top Jewish gangster in Chicago in 1938 was Jake Greasy Thumb Guzik. He was Al Capone's right-hand man. Uh, they had both gone to prison for tax evasion, but Guzik got out early and Capone was, was still in jail at this time. So before, so Judge Perlman calls Guzik, and Guzik says, I have to ask the boss. And uh, Capone said, sure, sure, we don't like the Nazis either. And it's true in New York as well. The um, lucky Luciano said, if you want to use the Italian members of murdering to fight the Nazis, that would be great. And Lansky said, no, no, this is a Jewish fight. You know, Mr. and Mrs. America in 1938 
didn't really know about the bad things that were happening in Europe, but Jews did because they were getting letters from their relatives saying that Jewish people in, in Germany were being scooped up and nobody was coming home. Next slide, please. Now, right next door to the restaurant where Guzik held court on Kedzie Avenue in Chicago was a boxing gym run by Davy Miller, the, uh, the former boxing referee. And here he is in action. I think you can see that he looks like a man who might be able to handle himself. He was a big guy and they often put him in heavyweight fights because he could get in there and separate the fighters and not be pushed around by them. Uh, and it was a, there was a little complex. It was a restaurant where Capone hung out and Guzik and next door was the boxing gym and above the boxing gym was a, a billiard hall, pool, pool, pool alley. And uh, at one time or another, every Jewish boy on Kedzie Avenue went in there for something or other. And Herb Brin admitted that, you know, he knew some of the guys in there as well. His, his father had had a, uh, a, um, a, a hardware store just a block away. So, and so next slide, please. Now the most famous of the fighters to come out of Davy Miller's boxing gym was this man, Barney Ross. He was a boxing champ in a number of, uh, of weight divisions and was on the verge of retirement at the time that he joined the, the, the anti-Nazi wars. Uh, he was concerned that his hands were lethal weapons and that if he happened to kill somebody, he would be in big trouble. So they gave him a sap to use instead. And, you conk guys over the head with that. Next slide, please. This is Chicago Nazi fighter Jacob Sparky Rubenstein, or Rubenstein. Uh, I don't know who the woman is. Looks like it might be a USO event. I don't know, something USO-ish about that. And Sparky and, and uh, Barney Ross were best friends since they were little kids. They both had moms who were institutionalized with uh, mental problems. And that was kind of what held them together. And they remained friends for their entire lives. So I, Sparky was, was her Bryn's contact. He would, uh, he would take the information about where the next, next uh, Nazi meeting was gonna be. And then Sparky would lead the, the fighters there and, and start kicking butt. Next slide, please. Oh boy primary voice of anti-Semitism in 1938 belonged to this man, a Catholic priest named Father Charles Coughlin. You think he would know better? He had a syndicated radio show on Sunday afternoons in which he said, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, Jews are all communists and they're enemies of the people. And so at the time when the the, the gangsters in Chicago were fighting the Nazis. Uh, Anti-Semitism was in the very air. Next slide, please. There was no city in America that Hitler wanted to control more than Los Angeles. He felt that if he could take over the Hollywood studios, which were the world's greatest propaganda machine, he could win the hearts and minds of Americans without fire, firing a single shot. Now, it didn't work because, as happened in Chicago, a, uh, a lawyer by the name of Lewis found Jewish men and women who could pass for Gentiles, infiltrated the organization, and using some clever means, which you'll read about in the book, kind of foiled the plot. And the plot was really, really horrible. They were going to kidnap Jewish movie stars and movie moguls and execute them in public. Uh, it was just horrible, but it never happened. And that particular fight took place a couple of years before the gangster versus Nazi wars, um, which came in 1938. Next slide, please. Yeah, this was the fellow that Judge Perlman called Mickey Cohen, LA hoodlum. And the, the situation in Los Angeles was, was different from other American cities because the gangsters and the police were so intertwined that it was difficult to tell them apart. Some gangsters were policemen. Uh, 
the uh, but Cohen again, he was another guy who had already punched anti Semites before he was told that it was his patriotic duty to do so. He had once been in an LA uh, holding cell with uh, two anti Semites, and when the guard turned his back, Cohen just bogged their heads together like Superman used to do on the old TV show. <laughs> And then he went over to the other side of the cell and started reading a newspaper. When the guard came back, said, so what happened? Cohen said, those two guys got in a fight. I don't know what it was about. Next slide, please. This is Benjamin Bugsy Siegel. He loved L.A. because he loved starlets. He, he's, a, he's an interesting guy. When he, was, when he was in jail in Los Angeles, they had a special cell built for him so that he could have food brought in. He could have women come visit him whenever he wanted. Uh, it, it was really more like a, an apartment you know, in, in the annex of, of the jail. Very, uh, very accommodating. And he ended, up, uh, he ended up dead on his girlfriend's couch from bullets fired through the window, no longer having movie star looks. Next slide, please. Now, would you buy a used car from this guy? In addition to the German American Bund, the other Nazi organization in 1938 were the, uh, the Silver Lodge, run by this guy, William Dudley Pelly. He had been a former um, Hollywood writer. He wrote scenarios for silent films, but he claimed that he'd had a near-death experience. He went to heaven and God sent him back to earth to spread the word about the glory that was Adolf Hitler. And there were, of course, a certain number of people who believed that story and became his disciples. Next slide, please. Now, because the, uh, the Bund soldiers were known as the brown shirts, the uh, Silver Lodge's men were called the silver shirts, although in reality, their shirts were light blue. Next slide. Yep, there, there. There's another one. It's, uh, you know, I, I, I have to admit, I, I'm not sure what the L stands for, but uh, Lodge, maybe Lodge. It's the Silver Lodge. Um, but they look like Boy Scouts, right? And it's, uh, they're going to go out to do some good deeds and maybe, maybe kill Jews while they're at it. Next slide, please. Now, I've looked, and as far as I can tell, this is the only action shot of uh, gangsters fighting Nazis. It was, uh, it was a, these fights took place between two groups of people. Neither one of them wanted their pictures in the paper. So, I mean, there are stories about uh, the gangsters grabbing a, they photojournalist camera and pulling out the film and saying, sorry, no pictures. But this guy is apparently already in place when the gangsters burst in. Let's see. I, this is... Refer to my notes for just a second. Yeah, this takes place in the Bund Hall in Union City, New Jersey. And Fritz Kuhn, I think we're looking at the back of his head there at the bottom, uh, is in the restaurant just off the main hall having a schnapps before his speech. He, he drank constantly, so he had, a, he had a schnapps after his speech too. But the, the, uh, the gangsters came bursting in and a photographer stood up on a table and shot this picture down and it appeared in the New Jersey newspapers the next day. Next slide, please. Now, this is Davy the Jew Berman a nickname you don't hear that much anymore. And he was in charge of the battle against the Silver Shirts in Minnesota. Uh, he was born in Ukraine, moved to America as a small child, and worked as a newsie on a street corner where he experienced intense anti-Semitism and routinely you know, busted bullies in the chops so successfully, in fact, that he became a safety guard for all of the newsies all the Jewish newsies who worked the street corners of uh, the Twin Cities. And he grew up to uh, run the rackets in St. Paul and Minneapolis. Next slide, please. 
Okay, now we've moved on to 1939. And Fritz Kuhn decides he's going to have one last, one last gasp. The Bund is, is hurting because of all of the, uh, of the attacks that, you know, they can't meet in private. They can't, uh, their secrets are getting out. Um, so he decides that he's going to have one show that's so big that a handful of Nazis won't be able to disrupt it. So he, he rents out Madison Square Garden. It's a national pro-America convention, he says. And he brings in Nazis from all around the country, people coming in, hotels are filled. And there's going to be speech after speech after speech. And this time, the Nazis really aren't necessary because outside Madison Square Garden, the streets are just packed with protesters. Now, it's 19, so there's a year after the, our story begins and the Nazi problem has gotten into the consciences of a lot more people than were called by Judge Perlman. You know, he got the ball rolling, and boy, is the ball rolling now. But the New York police don't want a full-fledged riot at Madison Square Garden, so they've got all the entrances really well guarded, and the protesters are pretty much on the outside, and the Nazis are on the inside, except for Izzy Greenbaum, an unemployed plumber who sneaks into Madison Square Garden, waits until Fritz Kuhn is giving a speech, runs up on the stage, pulls the plug on his microphone while the crowd gasps, screams, Hitler had one ball, and is promptly fallen on by a bunch of security guards. And they pull his pants down, which gets a big laugh from, uh, from the Nazi audience. Then as now, far right wing people always have the classiest sense of humor. Next slide, please. Here's Izzy. Izzy has been rescued from the Nazis by the NYPD and is being taken to jail. Um, although, as you can see, the, the cops are in a pretty good mood. Izzy's still a little fretful, but he, his, his troubles are over. He's, he's fine. Um, and the next day when he's be, uh, taken before a judge, the courtroom is packed with Jewish men who all want to be the one to pay his bail because he's a hero. And Fritz Kuhn's idea of having this great pro-America party in Madison Square Garden that was going to make headlines across the nation about how great and peaceful and how sane all the, the Nazis were. Instead, all the headlines are about the one plumber disrupted the, the entire thing. Um, yeah, when, when Izzy gets home, there's a, uh, a gift basket waiting for him for, uh, from Meyer Lansky saying good work. Uh, and he uh, is after Pearl Harbor, he enlists and uh, fights the Nazis in the, this time with bullets and bombs. Oh, one, one interesting point, back to, going back to Nat Arno, who ran the Minutemen in Newark, he too, he enlisted right after Pearl Harbor and was among the, uh, the soldiers who attacked uh, Normandy on uh, D-Day and then marched across Europe all the way to Berlin and claims that on two separate occasions, he saw POWs being marched in the opposite direction, German POWs, that he recognized and who recognized him because they had fought in street fights in Newark, New Jersey. So it really was the little war before the big war. And next slide, please. And then Pearl Harbor changed everything. Uh, everybody's role changed. The, uh, the German Nazis who were hiding behind the US Constitution uh, suddenly lost that privilege. They were no longer protected by free speech. They were committing sedition, uh, plotting to overthrow the US government, and some of them were jailed. A lot of the uh, Germans who attended those meetings were drafted and they were sent to the Pacific where their allegiances wouldn't be, uh, wouldn't be questioned. The, uh, the Jewish fighters went into the US Army and fought in Europe. Murdering guys went back to their day jobs. And there, there was a, a time when I thought that it really had hit the reset button and that all that had happened with the, the fist fights in the streets uh, was pretty much moot because the Pearl Harbor 
you know, just it, it, it rendered the little war meaningless, but it didn't, it didn't because in all of those cities, the Anti-Defamation League and B'nai B'rith had used their undercover agents, some of them gangsters, to create lists of the Nazi sympathizers in those cities. And I think I, uh, you know, I have a copy of that list from, from Minneapolis and all the members of the Silver Lodge. But those lists came in really handy once the war started because they could be used to weed out the Nazi sympathizers who had taken jobs building ships or working in the docks and were positioned to commit sabotage. So uncountable numbers of, of sabotage were uh, avoided because these guys were outed during the gangster versus Nazis wars. And next slide, please. And that's it. I, I, that's, I wrote a book about it. Uh, I spent mm, about six, seven months on it. Uh, I, whenever I'm asked about the research I did, uh, I have to mention that I, I started with a bed of knowledge. I already knew about the gangsters because I've written books about, uh, about the mob before. Uh, I already knew about World War II because I'd edited a, uh, a magazine called the Military Technical Journal. And I knew about the fighters because for three years I was the editor of Fight Game Magazine. So I'm kind of perfectly fit to, to tell this story. And, and that's it. Thank you for listening. I'd be glad to answer any questions. I'm back to help. Oh, thank you. Uh, we, we've got, <laughs> we have got, um, hmm, is Jacob Sparky Rubenstein the Jack Ruby who shot Lee Harvey Oswald? Somebody asked. Oh, well, spoiler alert. <laughs> um, the, answer, well, the answer is yes, uh, he is. But you don't find that out until the epilogue. Uh, although although they, I, I think the New York Post mentioned it and my publisher, put a, a picture in the uh, in the middle of the book saying this uh, Jack Ruby being led out of the Dallas police station in handcuffs but yeah Jack Ruby uh, and he's he's in this Dallas jail cell when Gerald Ford future president Gerald Ford and uh Supreme Court Justice Earl Warren from the Warren Commission come to interview him and he starts bragging guys you got to realize it I'm a patriot. You know, I, 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 I fought the Nazis in, in, uh, in Chicago. I, you know, we, we used to bust up those bun meetings. And that's why I killed Oswald. I wanted to show that Jews can be tough. A line that comes directly out of the Judge Perlman playbook. Um, got another question from Irv. Have you done any, um, I wanted to ask you, um, Michael, have you done any research on the uh, Bund in Wisconsin? You know, not specifically. Yeah. Um, we had a big uh, one. <laughs> <laughs> I, I suspect that, uh, that they might have gone unmolested because mm -hmm. I pretty much follow, I follow the, the fights. Okay. Not as much as the meetings. Yeah. I, I mean, we had a lot of gangsters too, but I, <laughs> I guess they didn't, you know, they were 20 miles apart, I guess. So, um, all right. Well, let's well see and, and it may be that Judge Perlman didn't know who to call. Ah, yeah. Because yeah, I think, yeah, it, it, I don't know. anyway, it's, uh, it's just no, not really. Oh, uh, Turner Hall Ballroom was burnt by Nazis, James Hines says. Okay. Mm. Turner Hall is still, was actually the um, Turners were the German gymnastics club. Um, so, oh, there was, there was all, a lot of the Bund meetings had gymnasts. Yeah. There would be a parade coming down the aisles and then there would be tumblers to show how you know, athletic Germans could be. Irv has another question about her, is the Herb Brin the same person who edited the San Diego Jewish newspaper, the San Diego Heritage you in bet. the 60s. It is. Yes. In fact, her, a story I left out, Herb Brin fought against fascism until he was in his 80s. He 
went to an Aryan Brotherhood camp and while distracting the lady at the, the reception desk, managed to abscond with a bunch of files, which he used to write exp exposés. Now, I, I interviewed both of his sons. They're very proud of him. But yeah, that's it's the same guy. Uh, let's see. Uh, anything you were um, wanted to put in the book, but you weren't, you know, it just didn't quite fit. I mean, I know you, you probably are like, well, I've got 10 other books to write that it can fit in. <laughs> Something <clears throat> that was kind of close, but not quite there. Hmm. Well, yeah, I, 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 I was tempted to write about uh, Lucky Luciano's efforts in Italy because he, he fought Nazis in, uh, as well, but not on the streets. He gave the Pentagon all kinds of intelligence about where to land, you know, and land at Anzio, because that's where you're gonna have uh, the, the best tides. And, and he had all the, uh, the resistance in Italy that if, if a, an American soldier mentioned Luciano's name, they would be told you know, where it would be safe to stay, where the Germans were, you know, everything you needed to know. So, uh, and, but I decided that it didn't fit. Yeah. This, this is really the story of, of the domestic fight against Nazis, which uh, is, is kind of important because it, 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 it's kind of important. It, it, it's terribly important uh, because history tends to repeat itself. Yeah. Well, when you write gangsters, gangsters versus Nazis Euro League, there you, you go. There you go. Look at and there, of course, there were gangsters that also helped the uh, the fascists. Um, I, I just finished writing a book about Carmine Galante, who was a, uh, a mafia hitman, and he bumped off uh, some anarchists at Mussolini's request. Oh. So yeah, so not the Italian gangsters weren't necessarily on one side or the other. Well, and, and but as a rule, the Italian gangsters were not in favor of the fascists because they were competing governments. I mean, the fascists and the, and the mafia both wanted control of Italy at the same time. Uh, the the deal with Galente was because um, Vito Genovese had been deported and was making deals with Mussolini to, uh, to I think, to just protect himself. And Mussolini said, okay, we'll, we'll let you live if you bump off some guys for me in New York City. I wanted to let folks know that we do have copies of Gangsters versus Nazis. Um, I put the link to purchase. It is actually 20% off right now. And oh, nice. I did want to let folks know also that you do get oh, book a plates. Go Gangster book plate. Um, so, you know, you can show your, in this case, showing your gangster allegiance when i sign the book plates and when i sign books i always enunciate my signature so you can see every letter uh, yes you know, sometimes you get a, you get a signed book and it's a squiggle you go, eh, mm -hmm. i sign my you're name not, uh, you're Darn not it. you're not a fan of the squiggle i kind of i kind of like the squiggle <laughs> yeah okay maybe if you're <laughs> maybe if you're signing a prescription but not a book <laughs> Um, last chance for questions. Otherwise, I did put the link in. Uh, you can purchase. Um, you were gonna. You were telling me uh, before the event started about the next book that you're. Uh, shot. It's a very different kind of book, but it was uh, seems super interesting. And um, and well, being that this book is, now. but yeah, boxer oriented. It's still. It still well, it, continues in the sports world. Yeah, it, it's about a golfer by the name of Johnny McDermott, who was the first American to win the U.S. Open. He won it twice in a row and he won it at age 18, the youngest to ever do it. Uh, and when he was in his early twenties, he came down with schizophrenia and spent the remainder of his life in a, a mental institution. And he was initially a charter member of the World Golf Hall of Fame, but his name has since been erased from their records. And we suspect, although we can't get anybody to admit it, uh, that it was because of the stigma of mental illness and it being a country club sport. We just, we can't have that type of person. So the, the idea is to give Johnny McDermott the uh, legacy he deserves um, yeah. and uh, hopefully, you know, make a buck at the same time. But if, if I have to, if I have to do it on the cheap, I'll do that too, because uh, I, I really want to tell his story. Well, you know, it's the kind of thing that if his, you bring his story back, to the you know to uh, popularity, you could actually change 
his uh, legacy too. Right, right. Oh, 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 I just just got word from my agent. No, I am not willing to do it on the cheap. Uh, no, <laughs> we're going to need the big money. Uh, last question for us. Sure. Um, from Anne, uh, was the U.S. government happy with what the gangsters were doing uh, to the Nazis? To, you know, how uh, how much support or uh, antipathy was there? Well, you know, I'm not sure about the U.S. government. I know that the local police almost always looked the other way or arrived just too late to really stop anything. So on a local basis, uh, absolutely everybody was paid off and, uh, and on board uh, the the congress they were having you know anti-american hearings themselves and focusing on, on the fascists uh, i'm not sure that there was a, a direct connection between the, the congress hearings and uh and the, the gangster activity which largely went unknown because they were they often blamed the american legion the gangsters would put on American Legion hats and then punch up a bunch of Nazis. And then on their way out, they dropped the hats. And the next day, the papers would say, well, we think they might have been guys from the American Legion. And the American Legion guys say, well, it wasn't us, but we don't care that much because we fought in World War I. And we don't like these, the idea of these guys getting aggressive again anyway. It had nothing to do with anti-Semitism as much as just we're going to have to fight these guys in another war. Well, I think that's our questions for the e evening. Um, thank you, um, Michael Betson, for thank you, Daniel. Uh, a wonderful PowerPoint and um, some great, uh, wonderful details. And I know if someone calls me uh, Daniel Bugsy Golden, it is there you go. Now you know what it means. Problematic, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Who knew? Um, good luck uh, in, in keeping enjoying these programs. Thanks to everybody. Thanks to everyone for coming. We wouldn't have a bookstore without you. Hope to see you in another event. Bye, gangsters for Nazis. And, and we'll talk about golf next time. And next time, golf. Or, Thank you. Um, Thanks, Daniel. Bye-bye. <laughs>